So, Father, pour out your Spirit on Mike, that as he shares his heart with us and you speak through him, we ask for your Holy Spirit to confirm that in our hearts, that there may be that divine feeding. And we pray for our spirits to take the lead of our souls and bodies. And you give us spiritual ears and spiritual eyes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening. It's a real privilege for me to be with you all. I know I'm not going to meet everybody, but I'll say hi to as many as I get time for over coffee. Um, just to introduce myself very briefly, uh, I'll try and be brief. My wife says I have the gift of teaching and the spirit of continuation, <laughs> and that I can't say hello in under 30 minutes, but as I only have 30 minutes, uh, I'm married, one wife, 42 years, and uh, two children, five grandchildren, grew up in Zimbabwe, have been in YWAM since 1980, uh, pioneered the work of YWAM in Zimbabwe, then helped pioneer the work in Mozambique, Zambia and Malawi in that order. And then the Lord said, go and live in Northern Ireland. And we said, where's that? I had to look it up on the map. In fact, we needed a magnifying glass to find it on our world map. And uh, when the Lord called us to Northern Ireland, my wife Roz cried for two weeks, partly because she didn't want to leave Zimbabwe and partly because she certainly did not want to go to Northern Ireland. However, we've been there 22 years and it's amazing how when we step out in obedience to the Lord, he changes our hearts. And uh, we love it and wouldn't want to be anywhere else. So we're hoping he doesn't move us again too soon. Uh, we started YWAM up in Northern Ireland in... 93, handed over the leadership in 2007. And now I have this wonderful title, I'm called an elder at large. So basically I wander around Western and Central Europe, engaging in what I feel like doing and not doing what I don't feel like doing. It's a great area of responsibility. So, so that's me. And uh, this evening I want to chat a little bit about our Father God. And as I said to some of you earlier, uh, it's been the pursuit of my life. Uh, I was filled with the Holy Spirit in 1976, which took me from being a nominal rebellious evangelical into a place of intimate relationship with the Lord. And since then, my journey has been one of discovering more of my Father's heart. And uh, over the years, as I've talked about it and shared about it, I've finally managed to condense it down to a 14-hour teaching. So we may be a little late finishing tonight. And uh, so I thought, well, what do I do? What do I do for just a few minutes together this evening? And I thought what the Lord put in my heart was that I should share with you tonight uh, a summary of the journey that I've been on over this past 30 odd years. And then tomorrow morning, I'll unpack it a little more with a few more personal stories. But I think my journey with the Lord can be summed up with the progression of questions that I thought he would ask me when I stand before him on the day of judgment. And each question has become discarded as I've moved on to the next question. So I want to share those three questions with you this evening. And it's a bit of a personal testimony. I made a commitment to the Lord when I was 11. Uh, it was more cerebral than it was heart. I didn't want to go to hell, so it seemed like a good thing to do. Uh, I wasn't terribly convinced that I was a sinner because I didn't really sin very much as an 11-year-old. I stole the odd cigarette of my dad's, but I never got caught, so it didn't count. And uh, really, I thought well, I was one of the easy ones for Jesus to forgive. Uh, there was another dimension to it as well, in that I grew up in a, in a Christian culture, and it was part of my culture to go through the motions of my church and accept Jesus as Lord and be baptized and whatever else it took to fit in with the cultural norms of my family and my community. But neither of those things contributed towards a real relationship with God as my father. 
And so by the time I was in my mid-teens, I was in real rebellion against God. And uh, then I came into um, my mid-twenties, Roz and I, my wife and I were married in 1971. I was a lot younger then than I am now. And uh, six years into our marriage, we had a personal encounter with the Lord during the charismatic renewal that was sweeping the world in the 70s. And we came into a deeply intimate place of fellowship with the Lord. And that began a journey for me. But the most significant thing was that that night, the night I was prayed for to be filled with the Holy Spirit, for the first time in my life, the Lord convicted me of my sin. And it shattered me because I had never considered myself much of a sinner. I knew there were things in my life that were wrong. I knew in my head that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I knew it all in here, but in my heart, I thought I was a pretty okay guy. And there really wasn't much wrong with me. Until that night, the Lord shone the light of his Holy Spirit into my heart and showed me why Jesus needed to go to Calvary for me. And it shattered me. It absolutely broke my heart because I couldn't believe that a perfect God could love someone like me so much that he'd be willing to die in my place. And that was the beginning of my understanding the depth of God's love for me. But at that point, I associated it all in the context of Jesus. It was Jesus who loved me and Jesus who went to Calvary for me. And so within three years, actually within three months, my wife and I were running a little youth ministry in our city, discipleship ministry. Within three years, we were in full-time ministry, working with Youth with a Mission. And my, my passion was to do to the best of my ability everything that I felt God put in my heart to do. Because I was absolutely convinced that one day I was going to stand before Jesus and he was going to ask me, did you do what I asked you to do? And that was the question that, uh, that motivated me. It motivated me to be obedient, to take risks. It motivated me, to, motivated me to make sacrifices. It motivated me to pray. It motivated me to pioneer new ministries and new YOM bases because I wanted to be certain that when I stood before Jesus one day, I'd better say, yes, Lord, I did what you asked me. We grow up in that world, don't we? We grow up in a world in which we have to perform to be accepted. Whether it's in the workplace, the university campus, the school campus, uh, whether it's in our homes, wherever it is, from a very early age we are taught we have to perform, we have to reach certain standards in order to be good enough, in order to be accepted. And it's driven into us. And if we come from bigger families, we may have wonderful parents, but we compete with one another for dad's attention or more of dad's time or more of mom's time, as the case may be. And there's this sense of, I have to achieve more in order to be more acceptable, to be more approved, to be more loved. And so we project that onto God. And we think, if God is my father, if God is my supreme authority, then he's going to hold me accountable for my actions. And if they're not good enough, I'm in trouble. And so we spend so much of our lives endeavoring to be good enough for God. Always that little bit of uncertainty. Did I pray enough? Did I go to church often enough? Did I read my Bible enough? Did I do enough good deeds? Did I go to enough prayer groups? Did I do enough ministry? Did I go on enough outreaches? Did I raise my kids right? Did I treat my wife or my husband right? All of these questions. Am I doing it right? Because one day God's going to say, did you do what I asked you to do? And I don't think that's entirely wrong. Because to be in relationship with God has responsibility as well as privilege. And we do have the responsibility to fulfill his calling and destiny for our lives. It says in Ephesians, we are created in good works that he prepared beforehand for us to walk in. So God has a plan and a destiny for each of our lives. And we have the responsibility to discover that in relationship with him and walk it out. So there is a sense in which we're going to have to give an account 
of wh what we did with our lives. But if that's our driving motivation, we, move, we lose out on the fellowship and the intimacy with God. And uh, I've traveled many, many nations over the last 30 years, spent endless hours with young adults and older adults, and met people by the hundred who have laid down their lives sacrificially to serve the Lord. And they've given everything they have in energy and time and prayer and resources to serve the Lord faithfully. And yet they've never known what it means to be in a place of intimate fellowship because they're always trying to do that one more thing so they can stand before the Lord one day and say, yes, I did what you asked me to do. I was a few years into this journey <clears throat> and uh, I had an encounter with the Lord which wasn't terribly significant in itself. It was simply something that came out of uh, our first YWAM base that we were pioneering. My dad had died suddenly of a heart attack when I was 22. Totally unexpectedly, he was my closest friend and it devastated me. And a number of years later, after we were filled with the Spirit, we were pioneering our first YWAM base and we were having a major battle over the acquisition of a property for a training base in Zimbabwe. And there were all kinds of crises, all kinds of challenges, all kinds of spiritual opposition. And I was struggling with it. It went on for almost a year. And I was driving home one day and I felt like the Lord said to me, I'm not your dad. And I thought, well, I know you're not my dad. But, but so what? My dad was a great dad. He was a good friend. He was somebody who was there for me. It was my relationship with him that helped me to trust you as my heavenly father. And then the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, I will never leave you. And it hit me with such force, I had to stop my car. Because I knew that my dad had loved me, but through no fault of his own, he died of a heart attack at a time in my life when I really needed him. And I projected that onto God. I thought, what happens if this God who says he loves me, one day is not there for me, right when I need him? Now my head says, God is eternal. God will never die. He's from, from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus promised he'll never leave us or forsake us. I know my scriptures. It's all in my head. But the truth is, we live out of our hearts in a time of crisis, not out of our heads. So no matter what knowledge we've accumulated about God, we will respond in a time of crisis out of our ex life experience that we project onto God. And so my life experience was my dad wasn't there when I needed him. And so therefore, what if God is not there when I need him? And I had to stop there and I realized, contrary to what you would think, it wasn't, wow, God loves me enough to not be there for me. I realized, you know, it's okay just to love God because I can trust him. I love my dad, but he let me down. He died on me. I love God, but he won't let me down. And so that freed me, in a sense, to love him in a way that I hadn't loved him before. That then coupled with that earlier experience of being shown what my heart was like and the love of a God who died for me, and I began to realize that actually my love for him is no greater than my understanding of his love for me. And so my second question was, maybe God is not going to ask me, did you do what I asked you? But one day when I stand before him, he's going to ask me, do you love me? And that threw a whole new perspective on everything I was doing. I wasn't doing this to get God to love me. I was doing it because I love God. And I thought that's a much more honorable motivation. I can do this because I love God. And we shouldn't be doing anything that's not out of love for him. It's valid that whatever we do should be an expression of our love for God because he says very clearly in the Psalms that it's our hearts that he looks at. He judges us by our hearts, not by our actions. So we can do the wrong thing for the right motivation and God will honor it. We can do the right thing for the wrong motivation and it won't impress him because he, he's looking at the motivation of our hearts, why we do what we do. And so my second question became, God's going to ask me, do I love him? 
And as I walked that out for the next few years, 10 years or so, I started to realize actually there's not a lot of difference between those two questions. Because on the one hand, I was striving to do what he wanted me to do. And on the other hand, I'm now trying to prove that I love him by doing what he wants me to do. There's still a motivation of, of striving to achieve, striving to impress, striving to be good enough, striving to be accepted, coming through in my motivation. I want, I want God to know that I love him. I need him to know that I love him. And the best way I can show that is to do everything he wants me to do and sacrifice as much as possible because surely the more I sacrifice, the more it proves that I love him. And in 1989, I discovered that that is an exhausting way to live because having lived like that for 13 years, I burned out and hit the wall really, really badly. It took me nearly three years to recover because it was all about me trying to impress God. And then, three and, a three, three and a half years ago, the Lord challenged my wife and I to embark on a completely new ministry, to pioneer something brand new, something we'd never been involved in before, something that was virtually new in Ireland. And so as we stepped up to this challenge, his word to me was, his confirmatory word to me to engage in it was, go back to the beginning. And I thought, what does that mean? What does going back to the beginning mean? Does that mean I start pioneering new ministries? Uh, does that mean I go back to Zimbabwe and the sunshine and no rain and all those other wonderful things? It didn't mean that. And uh, so, so what did back to the beginning mean? And in our early days of our walk with the Lord, back in the 70s, because of the conflict that was going on in what was then Rhodesia, we had a thing called Early Morning Prayer Watch and we used to get up at five in the morning to pray for an hour for the nation, seven days a week. And I was thinking, Lord, you don't want me to go back there, do you? Five o'clock in the morning is not nearly as appealing when you're living in Ireland as it is when you're living in Zimbabwe. But no, he didn't mean that either. So we embarked on this new ministry and this last three years has been transformational for us because we realized that back to the beginning was back to an understanding a deeper understanding of who he is as our Father. Because I've come to realize that actually the question God is going to ask me when I stand before him is not, did you do what I asked you to do? Is not, do you love me? The question my Father is going to ask me is, did you believe that I loved you? You see, that's the pivotal question for all of us. Do we believe that our Father God loves us. Not because we've achieved, not because we've succeeded, not because we've tried hard, not because we've done our best, but simply because we're his kids and he loves us. We have a Father who loves us unconditionally. And the only way to experience the reality of that is to let go of the experiences in our life that have contributed to our concept of who God is as our Father. I'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow morning uh, in a slightly different vein. But I've realized how much what we experience impacts on our understanding of who God is. You see, parents were God's idea, not ours. He gave us parents so that we would have a tangible, finite representation of who He is as our as our intangible, infinite Father. But somewhere along the line, as parents, we drop the ball. And so what we pass on to our kids is not the model that God wanted us to pass on. Somebody said to me many years ago that uh, the most important job in the world is the one we get no training for, which is parenting. But it's not true. It's the job we get the most training for. Because from the day we are born, we are mentored into parenthood by our parents. And what we experience, what we learn, what takes a hold in our hearts and shapes our worldview and our understanding is what we take with us as parents to our children. And if we've had a difficult or bad experience, we come into our own role as parents with the determination, I'm not going to be like that. 
And so we work hard at not being what we thought was wrong in the experience that we had. But it's still about us striving to achieve something and it's still a failed model because we're, we're building our positive on the foundation of the negative that we're trying to walk away from. The only way we can redeem an understanding of parenthood is to encounter the original father. And the only way to encounter him is to recognize that what we've experienced, no matter how good, bad, or indifferent it may be, in our own lives, with our own parents, with our, with our siblings, with our neighbors, with our other authority figures in our lives, whatever we've experienced from them is not who God is. Now, I, I play a little bit with, with the scriptures because God gives us an imagination for a reason, I think. And uh, I love the book of Exodus because it's the account of, of God revealing his Father's heart for his people. He brings them out of brokenness and bondage in Egypt. He becomes their, their strength, their guide, their provider, their protection. He becomes everything they need, takes them on this incredible journey, takes them through amazing faith challenges, crossing the Red Sea. And he brings them to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, that Sinai, they have a unique encounter with God. Because when they lived in Egypt as slaves, there were three laws that governed them that were horrific. Because the pharaohs of Egypt were believed to be manif the manifestation of God on earth, they were sons of God, a slave was not allowed to look at the pharaoh, wasn't allowed to hear his voice, and was not allowed to pass through his shadow because they were not considered worthy of that kind of encounter with God. And if they did, they were immediately put to death. So then God brings them to Mount Sinai. He's delivered them, he's demonstrated his power, his provision, his faithfulness, his commitment, and yet they don't trust him because he's just another authority figure. And their experience of authority is based on the pharaohs of Egypt. And so God brings them to Mount Sinai and he overshadows them with the cloud. They see his glory and they hear his, sound, his voice on the mountaintop. The three things that in Egypt meant certain death were the three ways God chose to encounter his people at Mount Sinai. It's no wonder they were terrified. Later on in Deuteronomy, either chapter 4 verse 25 or chapter 5 verse 24, one of those two, uh, I've been quoting it for years and I still can't get it right, uh, Moses is reminding the children of Israel of that day. And he says, do you remember, you saw the glory of God, you heard his voice, and yet you lived. He's saying, guys, do you realize what God did there? He was showing you he is not like anything in your past experience. He is different. He's almighty God. He is for you, not against you. He's committed to you. His love is directed towards you. And all his limitless power and authority and wisdom and grace is directed at you because you're his child. That day at Mount Sinai, the world's first bunch of refugees became a nation, the most significant nation on planet Earth, because they had an encounter with God. Their understanding of authority was changed. They saw God for who he was, as a caring, loving, gracious father. Now, they weren't particularly good with what they did with it for the next 40 years, but, but they, they saw it. They got a hold of it. We need to do the same. We need to understand that we have a father who is for us, not against us. His love towards us is unconditional. And the only way to acknowledge that, to grasp that, is for us to have personal encounters with him. And the way to do that is to take whatever experience we've had and say, Father, this, this is what I've lived with. This is what has shaped my understanding of fatherhood. This is what has shaped my understanding of authority. I want to lay it down at the feet of the cross. And I want you to renew my understanding of fatherhood. It culminated for me just over a year ago. I was working on this new project we were working on. It involves a, a lot of construction work. And uh, I'm brilliant at construction because my background is I'm an accountant. Go figure. And uh, <laughs> I was, it was one of those days where nothing worked. The tools broke, my measurements were wrong, nothing worked. And I sat down in the dirt and I said, God, I just don't get it. I'm, I'm just not up to this job. And instantly, 
I had a vision. One of the two most profound encounters I've had with the Lord in my entire life. I'll share the other one tomorrow, so come back. And uh, I, was in, I was in the throne room of heaven. I could see a vaguely human form, a brilliant light, seated on a throne. And either side of the throne were these two monumental white pillars, and then it just faded into nothing. All I could see was the pillars and the throne between it and what I believed to be the Father sitting on the throne. And I was awed by this. I thought, wow, this is the throne room of heaven. And as, as I was looking at this in awe, I heard a voice say, who is worthy to open the seals? Scripture from Revelation. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw Jesus walking towards the throne. And I was terrified. I thought, but I was awed, but terrified. I have no right to be here. I was having this tiny little vision of the most momentous moment of all of eternity, Jesus being restored to the right hand of the Father. And so I cowered behind another pillar so that I wouldn't be seen. But I kept looking because I couldn't take my eyes off it. And as Jesus walked past, he stopped, he didn't say a word, he turned to me and he took my hand. And he took me with him up to the throne. It's just over a year ago, that moment transformed my understanding of my Father's love forever. It's not about me. It's not about how much I love him. It's not about how hard I work for him. It's not about my sincerity and my commitment and my faithfulness. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the fact that he loves me. And why did Jesus come? I believe he came for three reasons. He came to reveal the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came to show us how it's possible to live in relationship with the Father as he lived out that relationship and taught it in his earthly life. And thirdly, he came to go to Calvary so that we could be raised up with him to the right hand of the Father and enjoy that same relationship. We have this awesome Father God who is for us, not against us. And he doesn't want our striving and our best intentions. He doesn't want our proving our love for him. He wants us first and foremost to know that he loves us. Because when we fully grasp how deeply we're loved, it frees us to be who he created us to be. It frees us to take risk. It frees us to make mistakes. It frees us to have bad, bad hair days. It frees us to miss church once in a while. I didn't say that, Tony. So. It frees us to be real, to be who we are with our ups and downs and our ins and outs and our struggles and our conflicts and our difficulties because it doesn't matter what we do or won't do, we have a Father who loves us unconditionally and eternally. So I want to stop there for this evening. And uh, Jan was going to have some questions for us to share, but I have an idea I messed up his questions. So, uh, but I'd just like to pray briefly before I shut, if we can do that while Tony's coming up. Let's pray together. Father, you love us the most awesome reality in all of creation, in all of eternity, is that you created us in your image and you love us. Love us so much that nothing was too high a price to pay to give us the freedom to enter into fellowship with you, to free us from the bondage of sin, from the consequences of sin, and to free us to choose to simply enter into the embrace that you offer us as your children. Father, I pray for us tonight that wherever we are on our journey, whether we're in this place of doing the best we can so that one day we can say, yes, we did it, or whether we're in that place of saying, Lord, I want you to know that I love you. Good though those are, Father, will you bring us to the place of personal encounter with you where we discover that the most important thing of all is that you love us. Amen.